Hi there, I'm Anthony Chung and I'm the Head of Market Analysis here at Amplify Trading. Every weekday morning I'll deliver a fundamental rundown ahead of the European Open. But if you subscribe to the channel, you'll also get content from the rest of the team. So, let's begin. Okay, very good morning. Hope everyone is doing well. It is Thursday the 19th of November. Going to have a, a quick review of what happened last night at the close of Wall Street. Obviously we did have a bit of selling pressure come in particularly on the back of the fact that New York City have said they're going to um, lock down once again the nation's largest public school system in the city. Uh, we've also seen uh, hospitalizations continuing to move up in the majority of US states and subsequently the death toll continues to rise at this point in time, uh, requiring further restrictions. So. Uh, that was one of the main news stories from late yesterday. Uh, we're looking at the charts here this morning, so in the center charts here, you can see reflected then, uh, I've got the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P in the center charts going left to right. And just having a look at some of these here in a bit more detail, and I've kind of annotated them to to really go over the the movement that's happened in markets over the last week or so. And let me just, remove my camera for one moment so you can see uh, the full chart and this is looking at the S&P 500 and recent price patterns which does gives us, give us a few technical levels of interest to be monitoring as we go further forward. Uh, here then the, the kind of framework provided by the Pfizer peak on the initial news that came out uh, then you've got the Moderna pop that came out uh, which is the weekly high We've had a retest and fail to break above that prior high and area of resistance that we were seeing. Uh, this was in yesterday's session uh, and around that same location of the descending kind of trend line that we've had in play here. And then the New York shutdown on the school system came out uh, late into the close on Wall Street, exacerbated by the breakthrough of the kind of weekly range uh, low, and that just sort of some increased selling pressure and momentum into the closing bell. Uh, we have reverse caused a little bit, uh, but as you can see here, we're finding a bit of resistance on the pullback at around uh, a technically uh, relevant level, which was the resistance that we were seeing in the middle part of the prior week's price activity around 35.74 and a quarter. So that, for the moment, remains an upside obstacle. Um, any further recovery through that, then you've got the pivot level at uh, 80, and then you've got that previous. Uh, weekly range low that would come in up around here at 85 and three quarters to keep an eye on. Uh, conversely, if we move back down uh, on the downside, then we'd be looking at that uh, overnight Asia Pacific low, which is around 53 and three quarters, uh, and then really not anything too much too interesting until we get further down toward the uh, the S1 and then the S2, which then starts to bring in the low end of last week's range. So definitely some key areas there to keep an eye on on the, the S&P. And also just looking at the Dow, uh, kind of similar in a way, but almost even more technically sound in terms of the response on the uh, Pfizer Moderna double top, if you want to call it that. I thought it was quite interesting how over the course of the last uh, week and a half or two weeks now, almost of price activity, when we had that initial uh, kind of much more aggressive spike on that first Pfizer news. Uh, that was pretty much to the tick in the Dow uh, at the same level and of course uh, at 30,000 if you're looking at around the futures price. Uh, since that point then, uh, a couple of nice trend line breaks first on the, uh, the upward move and then just capping some of the, well on the break here that we had uh, on Tuesday and then capping some of the price recoveries that we've seen. And so quite a nice area there yesterday at, at the high, which was coming just ahead of the US entrance, respecting the trend line on the daily pivots, it's R1 and the prior high. And then we just grinded back down toward the lower end of that range, uh, which was looking where we were going to close the day out at the bottom of that range. But then that NYC headline hit. Uh, and similarly, the Dow just came under some fairly aggressive selling pressure. Uh, we have now formed a kind of base though for price movement and that's what I'll be looking at on any um, retreat further in US equities if we do see that 
um, when the cash opens later. So the more nearer term range now, uh, looking at the price activity as it stands for the moment, early in the European Open, uh, is kind of defined by around 29,300 uh, and 449 on the upside, which was also that low that we had on Tuesday session. Uh, and we've, we've just seen a bit of resistance this morning already. So breaches either way, again, on the Dow, then looking for a pushback up to pivot and then probably targeting up at around that level, which would bring back in uh, this price activity from the high on the 11th and then respect, respecting of that from the initial weekly range uh, before last night's price movement. And on the push on the downside, uh, probably quite a nice area at around that S1 starts to bring in close proximity to the lows that we were seeing. Uh, probably about 25 points below would be the low on the, um, the pullback that we had in the afternoon on last Friday's session. So yeah, um, I don't really feel too much in a way of a bias either way for these US equity markets. So kind of similar drill to uh, what we were looking at yesterday where I prefer kind of just marking out either side uh, and just letting the market kind of flow and, and, and just following and, and trading what you see rather than trying to overthink it. Uh, because it has been a little bit tricky. Um, we're gonna talk about the dollar a little bit in this briefing uh, and that's been a, a fairly awkward one because this morning, uh, we can talk about it now. Um, the dollar is firmer. It firmed up overnight and it's trading up about two tenths of 1%. So seemingly then um, it's caused, or well, the dollar's strength has been a byproduct of a little bit of the kind of apprehensiveness over what's materializing still with COVID cases, uh, irrespective of the vaccine, and therefore a little bit of flight to quality bid perhaps. And that has weighed on some of these major currency pairs. You can see in the top left here, Euro dollar and cable are both down. Uh, cable, if anything, underperforming a little bit more, um, trading down about 50 pips here uh, in the futures this morning. Now, therein lies uh, quite an interesting thing. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through an update on the COVID situation, and then that will lead us nicely into the discussion about the, the dollar and vaccines. Uh, and there's some interesting articles I want to share with the Amplify Live community today. Um, so, first off then, um, looking at this situation in America as it stands at the moment, this is uh, an update. They have like a page on Bloomberg which gives you the kind of state-by-state -state, uh, trajectory of different curves of, of hospitalization. So you can track the numbers here, for example. Uh, so here you can see the, the actual figure, the percentage in terms of occ occupied beds because things like reaching full capacity causes certain concerns in certain areas uh, and so on. Uh, but hospitalizations, as you can see here, uh, due to COVID-19 are rising in 51 states or territories in the US, including 28 reaching their highest number since the pandemic begun. And if we switch that over and start looking at the new reported deaths, so not, not cases, deaths by day, in the United States, you can see here, I know it's quite small and quite uh, quite faded, but this right on the right hand side is the November 18th print. And yesterday we had nearly 2000 deaths. So this is what we were talking about week, two weeks ago, about the fact that the, the case uh, seven day average now is well in excess of 150,000, that this number inevitably was going to get way above that uh, kind of a sunbelt outbreak that we saw in the summer. The peak of then was substantially lower than the number we printed yesterday. And as you can see then that has dragged up then the seven day average to the highest now since May, when we were kind of coming off that initial tri-state outbreak. So definitely this, is, this, is, this trend will likely continue for some time as we have kind of said, um, over the last week or two, our expectation is that this figure, in fact, does it, it does top the initial outbreak over 2000. So uh, we are starting to see a bit of an acceleration of this uh, at this point in time. Um, overnight, uh, on a global level, we did also have Tokyo uh, just getting a few headlines because they're raising their uh, virus alert status to the highest level following re uh, record number of new daily cases in the city. Uh, and also overnight just to be aware of just covering that region uh, australian employers unexpectedly added tens of thousands of jobs in october their australian employment number for october came in overnight at 178.8 thousand expectations were for minus 30 thousand i'm not sure how analysts could have got that so wildly wrong 
but a you know supreme number. But if you look at the Aussie, that hasn't really moved. And I think a lot of that is because if you actually scratch beneath the actual numbers uh, and ask yourself, why is that number so strong? Um, Victoria's tough COVID restrictions began to be lifted, of which that data covers, essentially. So state workers return to the labor force. So um, I wouldn't say it's so much of an underlying renewed employment situation rather than people coming back to work, which has just inflated that number. Hence the reason the lack of real follow through. So for the Aussie, still at the moment, I'd say you want to be looking at the dollar, not so much the Aussie dynamics, but that's the same case really if you're looking at the euro and other dollar-based pairs at this point in time. Um, on the COVID side for vaccines, the latest we've had this morning, breaking news coming out, um, the, the Oxford vaccine. So this is AstraZeneca, Oxford University. The vaccine has produced strong immune response among elderly adults, citing data published in the full Lancet today. Um, however, as you've probably seen, uh, reaction is pretty small. Uh, remember their first efficacy data from phase three trials. This isn't what this is. That's still to come out in the coming weeks. So this is talking about phase two trials. So it's much earlier in the pipeline, uh, hence the reason there's no real reaction. Secondly, uh, there was a partial publication of this data back in October. Uh, so that's why even though it's, it's a breaking news and, and main headline in the media, it's not really moving financial markets this morning. Um, this does then lead talking of vaccines into this conversation. And, and this was a good article on the FT uh, because a lot of people have been left kind of scratching their hand, heads uh, a little bit. Uh, and a few things to discuss. Now, um, overall, we were talking a lot about the dollar yesterday. You know, undoubtedly, it's at a very key technical level uh, on the longer time frames over the multi-year perspective. Um, we have seen, though, a very uh, strong bounce from around those lower levels. Uh, the dollar recovered as we went through the late US session yesterday and it's gapped up again in terms of in the overnight session. However, that doesn't detract from the point that the dollar relative to the pandemic is down about 11%. Now, a lot of that is coming, of course, because of an extension of unprecedented and large commitment of um, monetary policy easing in various different forms. And the idea being, generally speaking, it has been pressuring the dollar even further recently, again, Xing out the last 12 hours of movement, uh, is the fact that if COVID is getting much worse and uh, activity, mobility in the US is going to decrease as restrictions kick in, then economically, the economy is going to deteriorate and the Fed are going to have to do more in some shape or form, whether verbal or physical. Uh, so therefore, the dollar continues to, to, to weaken in this extent. The other thing that I thought was quite interesting, I was having a discussion uh, with Tim uh, in the Amplify live room yesterday, and I was looking at generally the Eurozone. Now, France reported some 28,383 new cases yesterday, so still quite a large number. But the weekly pace of infections uh, is continuing to head lower at this point in time. Hospitalizations and the number of severely ill patients in intensive care units fell for a second day in France, and ICU occupation um, rates are now falling at their most since May of, of earlier this year, so a couple of months ago. Um, Italy registered 753 deaths related to COVID yesterday. That is the biggest daily increase in over seven months. However, the region around Milan uh, infections are actually slowing. If you remember, that was the region, new cases in Lombardy, where the original, original um, ex-China outbreak that happened when the epidemic was first taking hold, um, new cases in Lombardy fell about 10% yesterday versus Tuesday. Geneva as well, just to name another place, began relaxing its COVID restrictions beginning November 21st. So two days time following a plateau in cases. And this was something which was kind of slowly emerging last week, which is this idea that Europe is, is front running America because of the fact that they've generally taken more quicker and pro, proactive action in order to um, offset then the rising case numbers that they've been seeing. And so the fact that those were implemented a couple of weeks ago, we're now starting to see the effects of that, which is a plateauing of case numbers. So although deaths are still rising, a plateauing uh, is quite a positive thing that the markets will be looking at, that ultimately then uh, deaths, hospitalizations should follow suit. This is quite contradictory to what we're seeing in America at the moment, where they are chasing their tail somewhat, they're slow to react, and therefore 
um, the measures that have been taken in NYC last night or in other areas that we've seen since really this week on a state level started to kick in, that's not really going to happen in terms of the real um, success of that or not to to try to mitigate this surge of virus cases. We're not going to know that in the next two to three to four weeks. So until then, numbers are going to continue to go to go up. And this, this creates quite an interesting divergence then if you're looking at the virus being the main catalyst for generally dollar movement, is that then do you start to see a divergence between more favorable um, economic kind of expectations around the Eurozone as it gradually reopens against negative US as it goes into lockdown, complete opposites of one another. And does that then put further downside pressure on the dollar, but equally so helps uh, provide some under, underpinned support for, the, for Euro appreciation. Throw in the mix in the coming weeks uh, a Brexit deal, uh, whether that comes now, next week, or the end of the year, um, into what would be a very challenging situation in America that might require more monetary easing. Um, with that Brexit kind of lift, if, they, if we do get an agreement, which is the base case scenario, is that a trigger point then to break those long standing key levels in the dollar of which if broken, we could see a substantial move lower. Uh, so a lot of this is, I'm not, I'm not saying intraday. I mean, look, remember the golden rule, day trading, you know, you trade what you see and at the moment the dollar's rallying. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go against that trend for now. But ultimately, the top level view over the medium term is that I think the dollar's got room to weaken. And there's a couple of other banks with a few other added points here that I think uh, I, I just want to cover that add a few more um, kind of ideas around this, this thinking. And so one of these is then um, a Bloomberg analyst uh, kind of survey that they've done. Uh, investors anticipate the dollar index will slip roughly 3% from its current level by the end of the year. Uh, so don't forget then that that's going to put the euro, for example, up at some pretty interesting levels as we get back up to around that 120, an area of concern that central bankers have said before. Um, so this could, could have interesting uh, repercussions if that were to happen. But remember, that's a consensus forecast over a number of financial institutions at this point. So most the market is expecting the dollar to weaken from this point out and probably accelerated by that technical break that we were looking at. Now Citigroup have come out and they expect that the US Federal Reserve will continue providing stimulus to the economy and err on the side of caution before considering interest rate increases even as the global economic recovery speeds up. That could encourage investors to find a home for their money elsewhere as rising inflation expectations in the US reduce the dollar's relative attractiveness and investors target faster growing countries that may tighten monetary policy sooner. So really, um, we can look at history as a precedence, although the Fed perhaps a slightly different composition uh, to what was um, steered under Janet Yellen's tenant, uh, um, position as Fed chair. But the idea being is that the Fed are gonna be highly reluctant to tighten uh, anytime soon and to give any hints that that would be done anytime quickly. Uh, so therefore, those other places in the world might be quicker to respond and therefore you could get more favor favorable currency exposure, which by the net result then could be a, a weakening factor for the dollar. Um, separately, buying into US markets has been almost unavoidable over the past decade, according to analysts at Goldman Sachs as corporate profits boomed and Fed raised rates while other central banks stayed closer to zero. Remember, the Fed raised rates almost nine times in the post-financial crisis era and normalization, whereas pretty much everyone else didn't even raise rates at all. Uh, this has made their currency expensive, uh, setting up for large falls ahead, according to the co-head of Goldman's uh, FX research team. Uh, Goldman's expect the dollar to slide 6% on a trade-weighted basis over the next 12 months. Uh, they've added that vaccine developments are sufficiently positive that most investors should be positioning for dollar weakness. And they're looking at that in respect to uh, the fact that if then uh, a vaccine comes forward, there's no need for any of this kind of um, flight to quality premium um, kind of status that the dollar might hold and therefore consequently it should weaken, allied to the fact as well that they were talking about 
um, in regard to the currency being generally expensive looking at a, a longer time frame. So yeah, a couple, couple things definitely to think about there. I'll share this article um, so you can have a read yourself, but definitely worth checking out. Moving on though, uh, and getting through the rest of the headlines. This came out last night. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I shared it on my Twitter. So um, you know, feel free to follow me. Uh, I'm, I'm generally tweeting uh, throughout the night as well. Uh, but England will need five days of lockdown for each day relaxed at Christmas. Now, the, the, this is coming from senior government health advisors. Uh, and they warned last night that England would need five extra days of lockdown measures to stop infections spreading for each day they are relaxed around the Christmas period in order to allow people to see their families. Um, so applying the kind of math, it kind of works out pretty much perfectly given that the end deadline is the 2nd of September for the current state of national lockdown in the UK, that if you were to roll over exactly three weeks, that would land you pretty much then at Christmas Eve. And then if you had Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, Boxing Day, which is obviously in the UK, the main kind of uh, point of Christmas where people would probably congregate as a family or friends, um, that would mean we'd need to be locked down between pretty much a rollover from the second of deck out to Christmas Eve, uh, effectively, or the eve of Christmas Eve. So just saying that now, uh, it probably means that we've got another couple of weeks added to this second of deck deadline. Uh, again, it's not surprising, uh, to be honest. But one thing it does mean is that uh, obviously this does have uh, repercussions in terms of the uh, economic implications for the UK economy. Uh, and so that compounded by the fact that as much as most people think there will be a Brexit deal, until there is one, no deal risk is ever present and actually would probably be start to be priced in a little bit more as we get closer towards the end of the year. So the two things in combination could be quite interesting. At the moment, I guess the reprieve for the pound is coming from the weakness in the dollar on a more broader context, uh, but something to be mindful of. Um, all right, let's have a look at the calendar for today. Um, so in terms of UK European scheduled uh, events, it's very quiet from a data perspective. There's nothing really worth me commenting on. We get into the afternoon, we get the weekly jobless claims, fully fed existing home sales. Um, as I've said every day this week, normally these data points would be perhaps interesting. Um, the one thing that I, I think would be quite interesting going forward, if I just go into trading economics and quickly bring it up. So just bear with me one moment, but is the initial jobless claims. Now, I don't think they're particularly important for today, but if we were to look at them in the context of how they've performed over the last 12 readings, which takes us back to uh, that kind of sunbelt outbreak where they were tracking around a million, we've continued to decelerate, which is a positive thing. However, given now the lockdowns that are being implemented uh, and the situation unfolding with COVID in the US, um, my expectation is that this number will start to go up in the coming weeks and that will likely continue uh, into, into the year end. Uh, the, the question of how markets will and the Fed in communication might respond is how aggressively does this number start to go up, you know, re-accelerate in that sense. Uh, so, yeah, as far as the, the data is concerned, um, I'm not, you know, Philly Fed, again, existing home sales, they are naturally macroeconomic-wise important, but in context, uh, I think markets are more concerned about the present and the current and more, again, high-frequency data as to obtain then um, the implications of what's happening at the moment overall. From a speaker's perspective, yeah, a couple of things. Um, you've got... Fed's Mester, ECB's Christine Lagarde uh, and Schnabel speaking as well. Again, Lagarde, I think this is her third outing uh, of the four trading sessions we've had this week. So uh, I'm not anticipating anything really out of her. Um, there's, there's no need really to, to say anything new on policy, but nonetheless, when the president speaks, uh, it's worth just keeping an ear out when that speech begins. Um, and that's it. So going to leave it at that, let you guys get on with the day. Um, the guys will go through uh, in Amplify Live the full technical and, and trade setups uh, to accompany my, my kind of fundamental analysis. But yeah, as I said, have a look at those, those equity charts. There's a couple of 
uh, quite key levels, I think, to keep an eye on, both on the down and upside, not having too much uh, bias at the moment, but looking at the general setup of things. Uh, the dollar strength equities a little bit softer um, would be indicative then of markets being a little bit apprehensive at this European Open. And that dollar strength is weighing on the likes of the major currency dollar pairs, but also just to finish, it is weighing on gold as well. And as you can see here, gold is having a retest of the low we printed uh, in the late Asia Pacific session, which is quite interesting because if you look at the dollar um, movement and gold, it generally has been inverse rather than gold acting as a safe haven. And here you can see this is when gold got absolutely crushed on the back of the initial Pfizer news uh, on uh, dollar strength and the kind of silver bullet that people were initially in a knee-jerk reaction uh, looking at that Pfizer news. We know that's not the case. Um, but here then we're coming back down in close proximity only around 10 bucks of retesting that then low that we saw on the same days uh, on that price action. That is also the low that we were printing here that you can see in around mid to late September. So key levels here for gold that are in sight on the intraday that if broken, things could get heavy very quickly if we see a continuation of this dollar bounce that's materialized in the last 12 hours. Target there would be around 1820, which is around the top of the price action we were seeing uh, when uh, this area here is when we were seeing the US surge in cases in the likes of Texas, Florida, California. And that was when we broke at the time that double top that was holding the tri-state outbreak. So again, you can see how kind of COVID related it's all been um, in, in terms of this cross asset class mix. All right, guys, I'm gonna leave it at that, let you get on. Uh, have a good day, stay safe, and I'll see you tomorrow.